So in today's video we're going to be kicking off um, a new series called Species Spotlights wherein I zoom in on one of the animals that I keep um, talking about its natural history and taxonomy and things like that. So in this episode, episode one, we are going to be beginning the series by taking a look at a Laffe by Maculata, the Chinese leopard snake. Now in this video we're going to be starting off by looking at taxonomy, moving on to common names and then talking about a description of the species as well as its natural habitat and its habits in said habitat. So let's get straight into it. Using the three domain system of classification, which is just the one that everybody uses really, um, this species does belong to the domain eukaryota, which is all of the eukaryotic organisms, meaning that the DNA is bound within a nucleus within each of their cells, or if they're a single celled organism, the cell, um, with the prefix eu um, being the Greek term for true or well, and then carry on for nut, um, which, you know, or kernel, ref so that basically refers to the nucleus. Then the kingdom is animalia, the animals, um, the class, reptilia, the reptiles, um, the order is squamata, so snakes and lizards, then the suborder is serpentes, which is just the snakes. Um, the superfamily it belongs to is colubroidea, um, the family, colubridae, which is, you know, the colubrids, which is a term that everybody's used to using. Um, the subfamily, colubrinae. Um, and then finally, the genus and species is Alaphae by Maculata, and that is its um, binomial name. That, if you were to see, like, the scientific name of any species, it's going to be the binomial name, which is the generic name belonging to the genus, and the specific name belonging to the species. Now the genus Elaphe is one that's used quite often with many of the rat snakes. Um, the corn snakes were recently grouped in Elaphe but moved out into the genus Pantherophis or Pantherophis, or if you want to say it. Um, but Elaphe, the etymology of the word, so where it comes from, is it actually comes from the Greek term, I think, for deer skin. Now the specific name, which was first coined by Schmidt in 1925 by Maculata, refers to, well, by or die, that prefix, always means two, and then maculata refers to spotted, and that brings us on to its common names. This species actually has three vernacular or common names that are used in everyday parlance, and these are the twin spot rat snake, which marries up well to its scientific name, by maculata, two spots again. Um, then its other two common names are the Chinese corn snake and the Chinese leopard snake. Now, out of these, I prefer to use Chinese leopard snake for two main reasons, and that is that Chinese corn snake isn't a very good description because it gives the impression that these are just like corn snakes from China, which isn't really the case. They aren't even in the same genus. They approach a different size entirely, and the colour and pattern's completely different. So it's a bit of a misleading name, and so I don't really like that one. And then twin spot rat snake I tend to avoid because not all of them are actually twin spotted and we will get to that later. But anyway, that leaves the name Chinese leopard snake left, which I choose to use because it does seem the most appropriate. The from China, which is a fair description. And then leopard snake, well, leopard does kind of make sense because they do have spots, but they aren't regularly defined as the name twin spot rat snake says. <laughs> So this brings us on to a description of the snake itself. Now as far as rat snakes go, and just snakes in general, it's really quite small, ranging from about 60 to 100 centimetres long, depending on environmental conditions. So a snake that gets lots of food in its early months is going to grow bigger and faster than one that gets less food. Um, then sex, the females do tend to be a bit larger, approaching a foot larger in some cases. Um, and then also on individual genes, some snakes are just going to end up smaller than others, the same with people. 
Now in terms of scalation, um, that just some basic facts. Um, this species tends to have about 188 to 207 ventral scales, which is the scales on the bottom, and 23 dorsal scales counted from one side of the snake to the next width-wise. Because this snake is one of those species that isn't kept too, too commonly in the pet trade, it doesn't actually have any morphs that have sort of been proliferated by man, but it does actually have three recognised localities, or not so much localities as just variations, that are, found, are found in the wild, and you may be lucky enough to find in captivity. Now I've got a full description of these that I've taken from one of the sites that's linked in the description and I'm going to read them out exactly to make sure I don't miss anything. So the first morph or type, type 1, um, the description is as follows. Ground colour is yellow brown with four longitudinal dark brown stripes beginning on the neck. Within these stripes there are chestnut brown bordered spots. Near the neck, the markings on the head merge with the markings on the back. In both the male and the female, the scales on the anterior part of the body, which is the front, are smooth. Posteriorly, so at the back, um, they become slightly keeled and the head is rather small. In type 2, the ground colour is also yellow and there are also four, lo um, four longitudinal dark brown stripes that begin on the neck. Within these stripes there are red to red brown spots which have black borders. These spots often join together on the snake's back. The black borders are often less clear than on type 1. Similar to type 1, the markings on the head merge with the markings on the back. In females, the scales are slightly keeled, whilst males have scales that are smooth on the anterior body, but become slightly keeled posteriorly. Males have a smaller head, whilst females have a somewhat broader head. Now at this point, I'm going to mention the fact that types 1 and 2 do seem really rather similar. Now, um, type 3 is quite a bit different, and I will get onto that in a second, but I will just mention that a lot of other sources do actually cite the fact that there are only two distinct morphs um, merging together, types 1 and 2, so do keep that in mind when you're looking about stuff on the internet and in books. Now then, on to type 3. This one has got a ground colour that is grey gray to yellow-brown to olive. Um, on the back, there are brown to red-brown, but usually red, dumbbell-shaped spots, which can become stripes on the tail. On the sides, there are round spots with black borders similar to the spots on the back, and the scales of both sexes are smooth, but may be slightly keeled in some places. Um, the snakes have a small head. Now, if you've seen my snakes, which I've probably been putting um, clips up of them, I personally feel that they've got to be more of three, because the red spots is what they've got, and the dumbbell shapes on the back, the stripes on the tail, um, they don't really have um, keeled scales at all, um, and they don't really have very heavy stripes, so I'm fairly certain that mine are more of three, um, and that does seem to be, from what I've been looking at, the most common one that you find, but given that these snakes aren't kept too commonly, um, it could be that mine are just like, you know, one of the Morph 3s, and Morph 3s are the only ones that have been documented, but other people have the others. Now, Alafe by Maculata does actually have quite a close relative that's kept a little bit more commonly in itself, and this is the Steps rat snake, Alafe Dione, named after Dione, which is um, Aphrodite's mother, I believe, from Greek mythology. Now, differentiating between these two species can be quite difficult, and so in this video, while we're doing a spotlight, I am going to be talking about how you distinguish between them properly, so that you don't accidentally buy one when you're trying to get the other, which does actually happen quite commonly. The distinctions between the two species are really rather specific. So where the Chinese leopard snake, Alafe by Maculata, has 8 to 10, and very rarely 11, infralabial scales, which are the scales below the lip, Alafe Dione has 11 to 12, and seldomly 13. So typically, Alafe Dione is going to have more scales below its lips. Then the neck stripes on Alafe by Maculata are typically quite long and follow a U or V shape, whereas the respective neck stripes on Alafe Dione are typically much shorter and sometimes have a W formation. 
Now, one of these, um, which you're probably not going to be able to use to distinguish between them, but it is another one, is that um, Alafe bamaculata has 18 to 20 teeth in its upper jaw, whilst Dione has 15 to 7 teeth in the upper jaw, so it's got a lot less. And then finally, which is another one that is quite easy to learn, is that Alafe bamaculata, the Chinese leopard snake, has black borders or brown borders to its spots, whereas those in Alafe Dione are what we call open spots, that they don't have a board. <laughs> Moving on from the description, we're now going to talk a bit about the natural history and habits of this snake. So, in the wild, it's found in eastern China in quite a large number of the provinces, none of which I'm going to bother trying naming because I'm going to absolutely offend someone by trying, so I'm not going to and we'll leave that there. Um, now, it does actually prefer relatively cool and damp conditions, um, like in temperate grasslands, um, temperate shrubland, and it will also frequent arable land, so that's farms and stuff. Its natural diet, I actually can't find very much about it, um, but it is known to eat small rodents, small reptiles, birds and their eggs, so really it sounds like it's just what, like one of the others, rat snakes, fox snakes and corn snakes and so on. Um, being incredibly opportunistic and taking anything that'll move. Another gap in my knowledge about these snakes is whether they're supposed to be nocturnal, crepuscular or diurnal, which respectively means awake at night, awake at dawn and dusk, or awake in the day um, in their natural range. Now, from what I can find, they do seem to be somewhat like a corn snake in that they have bursts of activity throughout the day, but the majority of the activity is at dawn and dusk, and so it would be fair to call them a crepuscular species. Being that they're quite a small species of snake, the Chinese leopard snake um, does actually reach sexual maturity really rather fast, between 11 and 15 months of age, and they will actually breed in the first year. Now, eggs are usually laid in May to June and take about 30 days to hatch, 25 to 40 being the usual range. And then peak breeding activity is seen in July, August and September. So if you've got a snake, say, and it breeds in July of one year, then it'll hold that sperm and use it or the eggs will get going or whatever. And they will be laid in a clutch of about three to eight in the following May or June. Critical to breeding and a part of their natural life is quite a harsh brumation period for a snake. So they do need quite low temperatures over the winter, about 5 to 10 degrees is going to be good for them. And that brumation period does need to last about 3 to 5 months. And in this time they do just get, well, to use layman's terms, they're going to get psyched up for breeding. As all the chemical changes and stuff go on in the bodies that ready them for it. Now the last thing I'll look at in this video is actually the conservation status because that is an important part of looking at any species and for once we can actually say that human impact on this species doesn't seem to be having an enormous effect at the minute because they will inhabit the arable land and they do have such a wide range um, so they are currently listed by the IUCN Red List as a least concerned species where we, we aren't really worried about them becoming extinct or anything However, we don't really actually know very much about how like um, human expansion is actually affecting them, like population densities and stuff. And because very little is known about their ecology, um, so the way they behave in their communities, out in the habitat, um, very little is known about it. So how different things are going to affect them, we don't really know. And this is why it's very important that we do get a good captive population going before anything might go wrong. So then guys, that brings us to the end of the first episode of Species Spotlights. Now I've never really done a video like this before, but to me it's sort of like a more interesting topic. Learning about how an animal is meant to be, rather than how you're meant to keep it alive in the home. And to me that's just more interesting and exciting, and hopefully you thought so too. As I say, if you fancy learning a bit more about these snakes or revising what I've just gone through, then I'll chuck all the links and stuff down in the description so that you can find all the like sites and stuff that I've used to get this information. Um, now, this is probably going to be quite useful if you're researching these snakes, because there actually isn't very much at all that I could find about them on the internet. So, I've done the work looking for it for you. 
Now then, if you want to see more videos like this, then do tell me down in the comments and do subscribe to the channel to see similar content coming to you in the near future. Um, if you want to see more of the snakes that I've got that are a Laffe by Maculata, then I'll throw some links up in the top right hand corner of the screen and stuff. You'll probably have seen them coming in throughout the video. Um, so you can see my like unboxing them and in the reptile room tour and different things. But anyway, this is the end of the video. I do really hope that you've enjoyed it. Tell me what you think about this new format and I will see you in the next one. So I've been JTV Reptiles and I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.